Everybody to the Cinefilia Rediscovered final session. Thank you to be here. Uh, it's a grand final uh, because we have two important guests that I want to thank. Uh, at my right, you see Henry Jenkins, uh, that is uh, current. He, who is currently a provost professor of communication, journalism, and cinematic arts a joint professorship at the USC Annenberg School for Communication and the USC School of Cinematic Arts. Previously, he was the Peter de Flores Professor of Humanities and co-director of the MIT Comparative Media Studies program with William Eurekio. And he is the author of several books, as you well know. Jenkins' research explores the boundary between text and the reader, the growth of a fun culture and world-making, media convergence, be understood as a cultural process, as in his famous book, Convergence Culture, where old and new media collide. Jenkins' research also includes the field of video games, computer games, games for learning, and now he's exploring the participatory culture and the concept of spreadability. Uh, other books like Hop and Pop, Fans, Bloggers and Gamers, and uh, three upcoming books, I think. He's also a cinephile, as his presence here as pure spectator demonstrates, and he wrote an important book in the 90s uh, on uh, a film comedy called What Made the Steak Your Nuts? Early Sound Comedy and the Vaudeville Aesthetic. I want to thank you uh, to be here. Dave, David Carr at my left, is an uh, uh, important American film critic, critic of the Chicago Reader and the Chicago Tribune for many years. He writes a weekly column for the New York Times on DVD releases, in addition to contributing occasional pieces on individual films or filmmakers. Uh, he was a member of uh, many uh, festival juries, like Berlin International Film Festival, uh, he's a member of the National Film Preservation Board of the Library of Congress. Uh, Roger Ebert called him one of the most gifted film critics in America. Uh, many, many books. Uh, one of them, uh, When Movies Mattered, uh, reviews from a transformative decade, uh, is uh, very well known also in Italy, University of Chicago Press. His blog, DaveCard.com, is addictive for cinephiles, thanks to his reviews, rarities, essays, and material. So, we can start from here. Uh, I want to ask uh, both of you, uh, what do you think about the new perspective on uh, cinephilia? Uh, in these days, uh, uh, in previous days, some speakers claimed that uh, we are in an exciting moment, uh, thanks to new technologies which permit us to watch films on the web, uh, on mobile devices, on different screens, and also to maybe increase film knowledge uh, thanks to impressive av uh, availability of movies all around the web. But is it true and is it good? So, you want to start? Okay. <laughs> There's a cliche I always tell my students never to use in papers, but it's true. This is the best of times, and this is the worst of times. It's never been so easy to get your hands on a wider number of films. At the same time, it's never been so hard to just stumble across things. Um, there's lots of excellent new preservation work being done. At the same time, the uh, outlets for exhibition are narrowing all the time. Fewer and fewer revival houses. One American TV channel dedicated to black and white movies out of approximately 35,000, I think, around the air. Um, 
video rental stores are a thing of the past. I keep hearing DVDs are a dying medium. Um, at the same time, uh, you come to a festival like this, and it's full of extraordinary movies you just never dreamt that you would be able to see. So it's, um, in my experience, a very mixed, mixed field right now. Yeah, I, I generally agree that it, it, it sort of claims about the death of cinephilia are premature at best, um, but there are certainly reasons we should be concerned. Um, we were talking outside the tale of two cities comparing New York and Los Angeles, and maybe we can get into that a little more, but I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was there at a moment in time when movies were being put on television in record numbers, right? And so the afternoon strip would be universal horror films, and in the evening we could see lots of great old movies. And critics of that time were bemoaning the fact that these great old movies weren't being seen on the screen. They were being watched with, you know, commercials interrupting them for toilet paper and aftershave and, and so forth. Uh, and I think, you know, nevertheless, I came through that with a deep passion for films and stayed up late watching them on the Late Late Show. Well, even towns much smaller than Atlanta now have access to films through Netflix or the online that would never have had access to before. In the history of Atlanta, the, the period of art houses and retro houses is probably a three or four year period of time when we were, when I was an undergrad and was lucky enough to be there when there was a thriving retro house scene. But unlike those of us who live in New York or LA, most Americans have never had access these films and certainly have more access now than at any moment uh, in my memory uh, in terms of it. But the choice, the, the painful choice is they're by and large not able to see them projected. And I think that's, we have to decide when we think about what we mean by cinephilia, is it about that joy we feel sitting in the dark, staring at a glistening screen, which many of us in this room obviously feel or we wouldn't be at the festival? Or is it about the narrative and the, the, the cultural imprint? Because we may have to separate those things out as we think about what the future of cinephilia is. Yeah, I mean, speaking of somebody who was raised on late night television, that was my cinema tag. I grew up in Chicago, there were four local channels that showed nothing but movies all night long. So you would set your alarm clock to see The Scarlet Empress at 3 a.m., get up and watch it with commercials. Um, and by doing that, I had acquired a pretty decent film culture by the time I was 18 and went away university, and I find that um, the students I encounter now have uh, difficulty with that. They really have not had that kind of exposure that you just got by channel surfing in the old days. Yeah, I mean, it's, we're learning to live in an era of plenitude, and plenitude means people take, take things for granted. So I had the experience of growing up watching The Wizard of Oz every Thanksgiving, and that was one of those basic rituals that kids of my generation yeah, we didn't dare miss The Wizard of Oz when it appeared. Well, my son, my, in the age of the VCR, the first year it was on and my son was old enough, we had this great father-son experience watching The Wizard of Oz, and then I recorded it on videotape to him, and he then watched it 20 times in a week. Clearly loved it, and, but as far as I know, has never seen it again. <laughs> so he probably saw it more times than I saw it, but it had much less of an impact on his overall life cycle because it wasn't scarce. It was always there. Whereas you're, you're, I remember staying up late with a tape recorder recording All Quiet on the Western Front just to see it the first time. We're sitting there with Arthur Knight's The Liveliest Art and checking off in the index all right. the films that I'd seen and where I'd seen them. And, yeah. You know, this is, this is very much part of what it was to grow up at a certain moment in time as a cinephile. Now, I can buy all those films on DVD or a high percentage of the films that are in the, in, the, in the index. But that moment is sort of fragile at the moment. And I think that's the, you know, the, con the con concern I have, yeah. is we move from an era where I can own my own film library to a time when it's going to be accessible if they keep it streaming. And I have, will have no control over my ability to access it in the world of streaming, right. streaming media. And that, that's, I think, definitely a loss that we have from that. Facing well, every time there's a major platform shift, a significant amount of material gets left behind. And, you know, that TV generation, which also, those same 60s when their prints drove the film society movement of the 60s and 70s, um, when that went away uh, and VHS came in, we 
lost a fair number of titles that were never never appeared again, at least legally. And then when DVD replaced VHS, the same thing. Now that Blu-ray is replacing DVD, I think it's an even more dramatic fall off. And I'm uh, struggling to be optimistic about streaming. Um, there's certainly some great stuff available on streaming, but I'm not seeing uh, that kind of uh, migration. Even what we saw from VHS to DVD so far, it's um, um, the studios just do not have the same kind of interest in keeping their libraries exposed and alive, uh, with the huge exception of Warner Brothers. Um, and uh, we're now a couple of generations into um, uh, folks who have not uh, had that broad exposure, who, who know the most famous titles, who have probably seen the Maltese Falcon 150 times, uh, but who have never seen the William Diggerly version of the Maltese Falcon. That's a bad example, because it is on TCM, but uh, you get the idea. And this may be no different from the classical music fan who's grown up listening to classical radio stations, which now play maybe 100 pieces. And yeah. a month, and then repeat them endlessly. That there's something about we have availability or availability, but without uh, a systematic programming. And the role of the curator in shaping our access to films and giving us a context for thinking about films has never been more important. I think because we have so much to choose from, but it's very, very hard to for, for young people in particular to know what to watch. And that's sort of what the Arthur Knights and Andrew Sarris has did. For our generation, you know, there was a min, you know, famous monsters of Filmland with Forky Ackerman was an important sure. checklist for me at that point. But I, you know, the question is, what's playing that function now? Mm -hmm. Is it film school? Uh, by which case, you know, is that within reach of the, the the teenagers? Is it the list on Amazon that people put together of which films they want, they think people should be watching? Uh, how do we think about curatorship in the digital age, which is wide open? There are many curators out there, but there may not be a shared cultural agenda around which films people people watch. Yeah, it's a, you've uh, done a lot of uh, work on uh, cults and, and fan bases, and when you look on the IMDb, by votes, the most the greatest film ever made is I still believe the Shawshank Redemption, which is probably something that most of us here would not automatically agree with. Um, so there's an incredible concentration on a devotion to movies that um, you would not find favor with critics or, or academics. Um, yeah, and, and yet, you know, I think it's an, it's, it's an interesting dilemma that. I mean, I'm not necessarily going to defend Shawshank Redemption here. It's not one of my favorite films either, but I think it describes a different experience of movie going that may be more... You know, I think the cinephile classically has been deeply invested in the process of filmmaking, the formal techniques of film. But there are other kinds of viewers, there are always have other kinds of viewers who are deeply invested in the characters, the stories, the emotional resonance. And we tell our students this is a false choice, but I think if we're asked to rank, you know, I think there are very different experiences between what fans are seeking and what cinephiles are seeking. So I'm struck. I'm here this year. Many other years I've been at San Diego for Comic-Con about the same time period of time. And I travel between those two communities. Uh, and in that world there is still a lot of respect for classic films, but probably a different canon than would be established by critics or by academics. The same thing, of course, exists in books, where what literature departments teach and what are considered classics that people read generation after generation increasingly have less and less to do with each other. So Treasure Island would be in one category all very clearly and not in another. Yeah, it's unlikely that Twilight is being taught in too many universities. Oh, you'd be surprised. Uh, but, <laughs> I guess I would. But it'd be taught in a different way than I think we teach War and Peace. Right, and from an ideological point of view or a cultural studies point of view as opposed to a so one of the, you know, and the question is, fandom is certainly not in danger. Fandom as a mode of response to popular culture has, if anything, grown dramatically in response to digital age. That people are passionate about the stories and characters in their lives, and as I write about, hundreds of thousands of original pieces of fiction written around 
around characters from films and tele television shows that people are spending a lot of time debating and critiquing and working through. It's just a different set of movies than necessarily are going to be embraced at a place here. I don't think I saw a single science fiction film listed on the screening list for this festival this year. I may have missed something, but uh, the, the, you know that there are certain genres that dominate the festival circuit, dominate the retro house circuit, and other films play elsewhere and produce mm -hmm. other kinds of passions that other kinds of communities yeah. that are engaged with them. And I think we have to pay respect to both of those kinds of, of knowledge and kinds of creative response, or just aesthetic responses to works. Yeah, I think without the really dedicated horror fans, there would be no DVD industry right now, because that is the most reliable audience. They will buy basically anything that comes out. And without that base, you know, you, that's what allows you to release more esoteric stuff. Um, and that's a great example of a community that benefited from the web, right? The, this is the horror film, particularly contemporary horror films, never been treated well by establishment <coughs> critics. By you know, there are a handful of critics who actually understand the genre well enough to offer an informed judgment on it. By and large, there it hits the blind spot of middle brow art cinema taste that do, the critics have tended <laughs> to embrace, and yet. It has a very strong fan base. So on the web, I can find knowledgeable critics, you know, self-appointed critics, I'll grant you, but actually pretty knowledgeable critics. Mm -hmm. And it's an area where I trust the review I read from a, a knowledgeable fan blogger well before I trust anything oh, published in New York. Yeah, so you can see the, the dedication to research among the horror community is, is astounding. And there's just genuine scholars who are doing it for the love of the, the material, not for any uh, working toward a degree or anything. They, 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 they just love the stuff. And, uh, that's a great thing. And one of the things that interests me, the collector culture is clearly well represented in a space like this. And a decade or two ago, the collector culture defined itself in terms of who had the most exclusive access to stuff that they'd seen and no one else had seen. Now, if you go on YouTube, a significant number of collectors are uploading, uploading rare gems from their collections. So there are films like, like So Long Letty that I saw for the first time at the Wisconsin Archive when I was doing my dissertation that became what named Pistachio Nuts, that I was literally the first person to spool at it since it had been given to the Wisconsin Archive. It was being taken off the original reels when I watched it. And now you can find large chunks of it on YouTube. Which, and and I actually the Archive has released it on DVD. Yeah, yeah. I, fairly recently. So. Mm -hmm. So I so I, th I think there that's another example of where the digital is creating opportunities for us to engage critically with films um, in a ways we haven't done before. Yeah, but if you move beyond the genre to more classical auteur studies, then it gets problematical. I've been writing a, a column for Film Common, which is a bi-monthly American film magazine. The idea being uh, the people who should have made it into Andrew Saris's book and and didn't. Um, a director I think is, is dear to both was Bill Sider, who did a lot of the mm. Wheeler and Woolsey films and, and a lot of brilliant comedies of the 30s, uh, and who in his day was a major, major filmmaker. Worked with, you know, never made a B film in his life. You know, nothing but the biggest stars. You know, everybody trusted him. Uh, getting a hold of his films is a huge problem, apart from the ones with Laurel and Hardy, Wheeler and Woolsey, Deanna Durbin. You know, the the, the star angle, uh, but getting his Zazu Pitts films, uh, which are great, uh, is practically impossible. Yes, yeah, so, but that's a bit like saying, uh, you know, Mrs. Lincoln, apart from that, how, how did you like to play? Because mm -hmm. Wheeler and Woolsey films weren't available to me in any way, shape, or form growing up in Atlanta. I saw the first one when I went to Wisconsin Archive as a grad student. Uh, so even though I've written about them, them in passion, That was part of that uh, RKO package that played, at least in Chicago, constantly. There was a soda pop company that bought the entire RKO library, and if you showed the films with their commercials spliced into them, you got them for free. And for years, the only prints we had of RKO movies were these CNC Cola Presents. And I remember seeing Wheeler and Wolsey and wondering, these guys are really strange. <laughs> I read about them in Leonard Moulton, and for years wanted to see that, but they were not, by the time I was watching this stuff, Right. They were not readily available or not showing very mm -hmm. often in, in the Atlanta market.
it. So, so again, the question of uneven access or which cities had access to these prints seems like an important part of the story. Definitely. But how, how can we define the real film experience? I mean, uh, you mentioned uh, your uh, watching films on the TV or on VCR with your son and so on, but and uh, also the most fetishist in this era that is uh, Quentin Tarantino has grown up watching films on video mm -hmm. and now he wants to show his films only in 35 millimeters. It's a, a, it's a great contradiction for me, it's very interesting. But what is the, 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 the film experience, the real, or, or it, 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 it exists, a real film experience, a, a classic film experience, or the technology changes every uh, decade and we cannot now find out what is a real film experience or a purity of film experience. Yeah, it's all been downhill since nitrate, so <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's your choice? Uh, it, things change whether you want them to or not. And uh, again, as somebody who grew up watching movies on black and white television and very low resolution, you know, the, the cruddiest uh, bootleg on the internet looks better than that. Uh, <laughs> So that's uh, a step in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is, it's a paradox, because yeah, if you want to talk about print quality, I would agree it's downhill since nitrate. On the other hand, most of the projectionist widows would probably disagree that nitrate was the whole golden age of cinema. Exactly, yeah. uh, so, so we have to decide what criteria we're, we're speaking from. Um, you know, Tarantino is a really interesting example of the phenomenon we're talking about because it sort of shows in his films that he grew up watching movies on a, in a video store, which meant he saw bits and pieces of lots of films from lots of genres out of context, the things you half watch when you're checking out things to patrons. And he builds that into his films, but if you go on the web after a, a Tarantino movie comes out, you realize how many people are tracking down the films he's citing and watching them because they're referenced in Tarantino's movies. So he's impure in a sense of having a structure. He's not the movie brats that went to USC, UCLA, NYU, and have an organized curriculum. But for that reason, he's a great curator of sorts for a generation who has access to everything and, and is prioritizing the stuff that speaks to contemporary cinema in one way. Well, there's a good example of the Something that no longer exists is the video store, where you would go in, hopefully, you go in to rent uh, the latest Hollywood hit, and maybe you come across um, some Italian giallo or something that you've never heard of, and the cover looks interesting, and you take it home with you, and, and I think that's what happened with, with Quentin. And those films were not getting uh, much of a theatrical release in America, apart from 42nd Street and some of the you know, really hardcore exploitation outlets. And now they have become kind of a mainstream uh, culture for that generation of uh, cinephiles. Uh, who can talk about uh, Lucio Fulci with uh, fluidity they cannot talk about Howard Hawks with, um, but that's, that's what they know. But do they know both? No, Hawks and I mean, Fulci. my experience, no. I think you're right. I think that they're, 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 they're discovering the niche and the cult without passing through the, 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 main, the, the sort yeah. of mainstream of the past. Uh, and it's sort of, you find people who know everything about Italian horror in my classes, but who have never seen Howard Hawks or Frank Capra. And my, my ideal is always to teach them the broadest possible range of movies and get them excited about everything. Um, as people at this festival probably had someone who helped get, helped get them over the hump and see kinds of films they might not have seen otherwise. But yeah, they come knowing one area of very, very deep, um, because they can dig as deep as they want into that area and find expertise online. The challenge is to broaden that, but I, I'm not sure that that differs fundamentally from other generations. I mean, when I was an undergrad, Aaron Andrew Saris's death this week really left me thinking about this moment when I was an undergrad at Georgia State University, and there were people who were Saris fans and Pauline Kael fans, and I was an early Robin Wood fan, and we were, we have passionate debates about the movies that as they were coming, mm -hmm. as they as they came out, and then that each of those critics set a curriculum for us. Oh yeah, you know I look back, I don't make one of people who like Lucio Fulci movies because I remember when liking Hitchcock was exactly the same thing. Uh, 
He was like, you, you like that commercial crap? Are you kidding me, Alfred Hitchcock? I mean, literally, you would get into big arguments with people because that wasn't Bergman, that wasn't Fellini, that was commercial garbage. It was no interest to, to any serious person. So, you know, these things change uh, constantly. I, I think that, that uh, it's important to focus on uh, uh, different uh, forms of cinephilia because uh, uh, there is subcultures of cinephilia like uh, you said uh, Italian giallo fans or uh, Japanese horror fans but I think there is also a, a, a typical cinephile post cahier du cinéma kind of that who loves Hoax and Fulci, uh, Love Diaz and Bergman, uh, and uh, those kind of cinephiles are alive, but they are few. The most part of them are subculture, uh, sub subcultures of cinephilia, I think so. Well, everything's fragmented, right? If you look at contemporary music, the genres of music no longer here and you certainly yeah. would not say do you like rock or do you like pop you know as a category no one would well, no one could possibly answer that in the same way we've become a culture of specialists because there's more access to media than before we develop specializations to manage it and but nevertheless the passion runs deep I mean you think about the anime fans who learn Japanese and form teams to sub, do a fan subtitling of the latest thing within 24 hours of when it appears on Japanese mm -hmm. television. That's as passionate as the culture, the folks that used to hang out at William K. Everson's <laughs> apartment and watch yeah. old 16 millimeter prints of things. I mean, that's, it's a passion about the medium. It's just, it's... Yeah. And there's a highbrow equivalent of that in the, the people who translate <laughs> Naruse films, uh, Shimizu films, you know, stuff that they get the discs from Japan, they custom subtitle them, and they put them up on the web. Uh, they're not paying for the rights, which is another issue, uh, and something that really needs to be addressed. But it's it's happening, you know, that, that dedication is still there. Uh, there is any questions from the audience? Uh, I like the comment about, excuse me, I like the comment about uh, that there are cinephiles who have a broad interest no matter what the sub-genre is. And I want to compare it, and I want your opinion, to wine. When you meet people, they say, I only drink Bordeaux because blah, 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 or I only like Rhine, and so on. But if you love wine, you can like my comment is, I never met a wine I didn't like. That's overstated. But would you compare that to, you can make other analogies as well, but wine is a good one when you're comparing it to cinephiles. Well, it certainly reminds me of people who like to say to me, I don't even own a television set. Or, <laughs> because I, my usual response is, I don't even own a book. But the two claims don't have to carry the same same weight, and obviously one's facetious. But you know, no, obviously someone with taste is someone who's capable of responding appropriately to a range of different kinds of work, um, and that should be our, our goal. Refinement of taste should never be ex what you exclude; it should be what you include. In yeah, terms I think that was the, the, the great contribution of the Cahiers and what became American auteurism was removing those cultural distinctions and saying everything is on a level playing field. The genre film, the art house film, are both worthy of the same kind of consideration. And that's what I, I think Andrew Sarris really contributed to American film culture, is, uh, saying that you know, Hitchcock is as important as Bergman. And there was a time when you could get into actual physical uh, conflict about that. But that's certainly something I've always tried to live by, is that uh, all films are created equal, uh, there's no hierarchy of value just because something announces itself as an art film or announces itself as a, a trashy genre film. Uh, they deserve the same seriousness or lack of seriousness of approach. I mean, I enjoy making fun of Bergman films. They're, they're often pretty campy. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, so much of the traditional pre-autorist criticism was based on establishing your cultural credentials, 
you were a good person if you liked this kind of movie, you were um, a, a, a slob or a, a low life if you liked this other kind of movie. And I think uh, one thing that, that, that Sarah's and the people who followed him accomplished was to help to erase that line to some degree. I'm Miles. Okay, okay. Um, I want to make more of a statement than a question. Um, I'm, you know, I'm pretty young, 20 years old, though. But uh, I think something that's missing is for cinephiles, you know, newborn cinephiles, is a place where you can find uh, much demand. You, you said, you know, the uh, video rent store back in the day, you know, you get the movie, want to get this particular movie the, that came out, some, you know, big Hollywood blockbusters, and you found this other movie you never heard about it, but seemed interesting. And I think it it come to miss uh, it's come to miss uh, uh, that kind of space where you can find many things. Yeah, you know, I mean, the internet gives you a lot of things, but they're all in sections. Uh, I mean, you find that website or blog that just for that genre, like horror or just uh, you know detective stories or big blockbusters, there's less, you know, to find, to stumble upon something, basically. I see that becoming uh, probably more of a problem as uh, streaming replaces DVDs, because so much material is being dumped out at once, it's, you know, hundreds of titles a week, with no way of discriminating among them except for a, a, a tiny frame grab and a title, um, which is probably more of a problem for the studio marketing people than it is for, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't know any one person who goes to Hulu, uh, apart from the Criterion stuff that's up there, and systematically tries to work through this gigantic mass of new independent films that are just being uh, tossed out one after the other. And unfortunately, a lot of that, a lot of foreign stuff reaches America that way now, um, just direct to, to streaming. And really, nobody knows what it is. There's no journalistic attempt to, to cover that stuff. Um, unless uh, you know of something. Uh, no, certainly not, certainly not journalistic attempts. Um, you know, I think this is where individual blogs play a crucial role in terms of flagging things that they are interested in, but it will reflect this particular taste of that blogger and, and, and their readership more than anything else. Um, there, there may not be a general purpose space to go to in the way that you know the retro house represented for us, where I would just show up a couple of times a week and see whatever was showing at the silver screen in Atlanta, you know, for several several years, uh, just see whatever whatever they put on because I trusted a curator there to introduce me to something that um, you know, that I needed to see, but, you know, that, I think that's possible now, I think it happens a lot, but I don't think there's any person who does that and with a general viewership in mind. It's interesting, I, I was telling you before that I've done a little consulting work for Turner and have met with the Turner Classics movie team, and they're telling us that, told me at least, that a significant portion of their online viewership are young young people, that they see a huge growth of 20 and 30 something year old cinephiles who are interested in older American films and are trying to form an online community that will give recommendations to each other. And they, they're not necessarily turned on by the guy in the armchair that introduces the movies that, that looks like granddad's version of what cinema should look like, but they are finding online, online communities are a useful way for them to identify what to watch. And they're teaching each other what to watch in that space. And Turner's put, you know, putting a certain amount of energy, it's not necessarily reflected the way the on-air presentation goes, but the online presentation is, is somewhat different than, I think, mm -hmm. uh, the, the sort of nostalgia-based focus that they've done before. And we were talking before, Henry was saying that in, in Los Angeles, where he lives, it's common to see large crowds of younger people at silent film screenings. And where I live in New York City, it's the same, you know, 20, 30 old guys like me, uh, you know, sitting there uh, 
uh, by ourselves in an empty auditorium at, at MoMA. It's just um, it's maybe something is dying in New York that is being reborn in Los Angeles. Yeah, I, I mean, having just moved to Los Angeles three years ago, I've just been excited to see the, the vibrant film culture of Los Angeles, including long silent film screenings at the Academy that are completely sold out and packed with 20 and 30 somethings as much as anything, many of whom have ties to the industry. So, so much for Hollywood not being interested in its own past, what we see. Or the Art Directors Guild has taken on a responsibility of educating the public about their contributions to films. And they're going back to quite early work and showcasing them. And, you know, they don't have quite the packed house that the, the Academy has, but they're, they're bringing people along who are really engaging in films that, that probably they wouldn't have seen if they weren't part of a series like that. We got sold out of a Magic Lantern screening in Los Angeles just before we left for the trip, and I thought of oh, all the obscure things. I've got to be one of the five people in the city of Los Angeles who are going to be excited by this, but we got there and it was completely packed with families. So, you know, I think it depends on where we're located geographically, what the cult local culture is and how it's responding to the plenitude, the mixture of plenitude and scarcity that we're yeah. talking about. And we were talking about this before, and the analogous experience in New York, so, you know, Ernie Gare, who was a wonderful, wonderful avant-garde filmmaker who collects Magic Lantern slides, occasionally does presentations at MoMA, um, and it's the same 1,500 people. You know, uh, that younger crowd is, is, is not showing up. Jonathan Rosenbaum. Yes, I was wondering if uh, the panelists could comment on lists a bit. I think it, one thing that's always seemed to me very striking about the last few years is how important lists have become because of the plenitude of choices. But at the same time, there's been a very ambiguous relation of academia to the idea of this because of the anti-canonizing, which I've always, I've always been bothered by because it seems to me that academia, academia does canonize but pretends not to. I mean, in the same way that the Academy Awards is a kind of canonizing. I mean, that there, even if it's you know young Mr. Lincoln, because or or if it's canonizing theorists rather than films, there's still a canonizing process. But I'm just wondering if if um, because I may be too cut off even from my apart from my own occasional teaching to know what if academia has been responding to this situation in a differently or if it's still in the same stance that it was in before. Hmm. I mean, I, I, first of all, I agree with you that any time you put together a syllabus, you're putting together a canon. You know, as much as my own impulse is to push against the established canons, you're still always creating a new one. But, yeah, I, 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 I think there's still a big divide, between, at least in the American context, between ac the academic canon and journalistic canon or the Academy Awards or, you know, the Academy's increasingly cut off from the public in terms of its definition of what an important film is. Again, certain genres need not apply at, to the, at, when it comes to Oscar time, yet are incredibly important and vibrant for, for filmgoers. So, so academics are only part of an, a larger problem, which is, again, the fragmentation of different taste communities that are using very, very different criteria to measure what constitutes uh, a film worth watching. And that's both the best of all possibilities, because we get more diversity, but it does mean conversation becomes hard across those different niches. Yeah, at uh, New York University, there is no core uh, film history course in the graduate program. And the reason they give for that is that, well, if we teach uh, narrative feature film, uh, we also have to teach television, we have to teach uh, documentaries, we have to teach commercials, we have to teach uh, avant-garde, we have to teach on and on and on, and it just leads to paralysis. Uh, so nobody is pointing the students to any particular the titles, um, things things that you would expect them to have seen by the time they're uh, in a master's program. Uh, they very often have not, I and mean, they barely know who D.W. Griffith is. They've never seen a Howard Hawks film. At the same time, they can talk with incredible fluidity about uh, you know, every single episode of Real Housewives of whatever, whatever. 
But, you know, but in, fair, in fairness, if you're trying to teach a 13-week course on the history of cinema that is now 100 years old, how do you do? How can you adequately represent even the stuff we would all in this room would agree were canonical in that context? And what typically has happened is people stop believe cinema stops in 1960. You know, just the, just like American high school teachers believe world history stopped at the end of World War II. You know, that, that there's just we cut off, and the result is we cut off at a point that doesn't allow us to connect with what students come in interested in and excited about. So, you know. Um, I have a colleague back at MIT who hadn't added a film made post-1970 uh, to his syllabus uh, at all. And so there was no films he was showing that were made in the lifetime of his students. And I think if we can't find a way to bridge between the canon and the present moment, we may not be able to fully connect with the kinds of cinephilia that are emerging at the present time. Whereas Tarantino does a much better job of saying, here, I made a film. These are the films you need to understand in order to appreciate my film. So I ended up for a while when I was teaching a basic intro course to have a canonical title and a contemporary title that were in dialogue with each other and just do a double, double feature and teach the past through the lens of the present moment as a way of helping them to understand the need for vocabulary of film that shapes the contemporary generation of filmmakers, even if it's not necessarily something they've encountered um, already. I just wanted to say that there's something interesting going on in Seattle, Washington, in the United States that ties together in the last two little discussions. One, Seattle's a big film-going um, town, as many people know, and the Seattle Film Festival, which used to be a one-time-a-year, three-week festival, has now taken on uh, three screens for year-round because an old theater was going out of uh, business, so they're showing art films and historical films and all kinds of things on those three screens. Same time, Seattle University Film Studies is giving internships and discounts and everything just to get the students into this new situation. So there's both the outreach from the university and the availability through the festival, which I think speaks to your point about each community is different. And uh, speaking about the uh, film festival, what is the role of the film festivals in this context? What do you think about it? In the States, it's basically a marketing device at this point. Uh, the studios use them to launch their Oscar campaigns. And that's about it, you know. Um, uh, you get beyond a certain number of, of name titles that have distribution through the remaining art film distributors like Sony Pictures Classics or the Weinstein Company. Um, and there's a just an instant fall off to um, a pretty obscure um, art film fair that uh, nobody really knows what it is, and those are the screenings that are empty. You go to a festival to see the screening of the artist at a film festival, you know, a week before it's going to open commercially, is sold out. And the screening of the new, uh, oh, I can't think of a good example right now, in a Portuguese film or something uh, on the same day, there's, there's three people there. So they're not really feeling that function of introducing, exposing new work to people as much as they are serving as a base for uh, concentrating attention on something and bringing journalists in to interview stars. The most influential festival in North America right now is in Toronto, and that is almost really, it's, it's a 10-day press junket. It's, it's designed entirely so everyone can gather the American press and, and uh, have them interview the directors and stars of the films that are going to be pushed for Oscar nominations later in the year. I'm, I'm not sure I have much more to add to that. I, I'm, I enjoy very much festivals like this one, and I think we've seen the growth of older film festivals as well that are part of the story we'd want to tell. So. You know, I'm here and not at the San Francisco Silent Film Festival, which would be another great event uh, that's worth paying attention to in the American context. Or there are genre film festivals that are thriving. Uh, Austin has a, a science fiction fantasy film festival every year that brings films from all over the world. And I'm t I haven't yet to make I've yet to make it to that one, but I'm told it has pretty good attendance. But again, it's, it brings us back to the niche 
notion of a very specialized sort of interest. But then we have to decide, is the art cinema itself a specialized interest, right? What yeah, yeah. festivals have tended to show, you know, film, you know, have tended to stay within a kind of box themselves. And it may just be that's a dying niche, and that there are other niches that people are more engaged with right now. Hi. It seems like you guys mentioned that like specialization and all that stuff is becoming increasing because of streaming. And I actually would have the opposite perspective. Um, just I'm from I'm from the United States too, and with Netflix and the recent like shutdown of mega video and mega upload, you're kind of like forced to enter into this area where it's like only the licensed copies of like older films, just like how Google Books only allows you to see like older books all the way through. And so I think that like from my perspective, the specialization actually increases the amount of things that you're viewing, especially as an American, we don't really get that much um, exposure to foreign films in general. So I think Netflix does a really good job and other sites like it of exposing people in those niche uh, fields to different different directors and different types, especially different countries of film. So I wouldn't say that it's like, it seems like it's like a negative situation. Red actually seems to, seem to think it's pretty positive. I, I think that's what we were kind of trying to say, that certainly the access to certain kinds of films is much easier and, and uh, more widespread than it ever was. At the same time, uh, I constantly hear people telling me that you know everything is on Netflix, everything is on the internet, and in fact, Netflix offers exactly 12 films made in 1939, and nine of which are in the public domain. You know, and this is no way to gain uh, a good general uh, film education. When you're just unaware that this stuff even exists, uh, you don't miss it. It's, it's not that you're out looking to see uh, Leo McCary films from 1939 because the Netflix will not be showing them to you. Um, and that's, that's what I'm afraid of, that it's going to be lost, because the studios are not supporting their libraries any longer. They're not releasing older films to streaming or to uh, disc media. And they seem to have very little interest in it. Um, I'll talk about an area that Netflix has actually served very well. There's a moment, snapshot of Cinephilia in the United States is the television show Smash did a 10-minute Bollywood segment uh, near the end of the season, which was incredibly literate in using Bollywood dance choreography. And it's being performed by one of the runners up for American Idol on the show. Now, you know, by and large, multiplexes didn't introduce Americans to Bollywood. But Netflix actually discovered quite early on that South the South Asian market was a really lucrative one in terms of the use of digital technology. and so. Netflix has a large number of Bollywood films, which started to creep over, and I think more people have watched Bollywood films via Netflix than ever have seen an Indian film at a film festival. Yeah, uh, and so we're now to the point where you can introduce a segment like this and assume a general literacy of exposure to at least what Bollywood is, and without it ever going through the multiplex or without it ever showing on primetime television in the United States, you can put it on primetime television and assume people have some awareness of it. And I find that's a really interesting sign of the the sort of plenitude or accessibility of prints. But often in a, in a kind of yeah. campy, uh, semi-parodic, uh, contemptuous way. I, I wouldn't have uh, said the smash was contemptuous. I've never seen I mean, I thought that this, this that's, I've seen those, I've, you know, we've, we've seen examples of advertisements that were contemptuous of Bollywood. I don't think this one was. I think it actually showed a great deal of respect for a different vernacular uh, that was inserted on American television. And I'm intrigued by it. I still want to know how it got there. There's a lot of questions I have about it, but I find it an interesting snapshot of what Hollywood even assumes the average American knows, or it wouldn't be on prime time and as central to the series as this moment was. You know, like when Iron Chef caught on. I mean, people just like, uh, this doesn't even exist in Italy, it's a Japanese cooking competition show that was on one of the early cable channels. And people liked to watch it because it was just, it was campy and hilariously bad. People watched it to laugh at it. 
and very soon there became an English language version, and somehow all these bizarre competition shows came spinning off of that. Uh, but it did not uh, begin from a spirit of uh, cultural acceptance. It was making fun of these goofy Japanese. You know, look how crazy these people are. And, uh, and, and it exists you know, alongside a moment in time when manga outsold U.S. comics four to one in the U.S. marketplace, and where anime titles are probably the shared vernacular of a significant number of the students that I teach in USC. I mean, yes, there is a segment, again, as we think about the vision, even within a niche, we have some people watching things as camp, uh, and other people watching things because they really speak to them in a really powerful, powerful way. Uh, and I think that's the, the, we can't make easy generalizations because of the sheer range of activity that's going on around these titles at the present moment. Okay, just a short replay, and then just a moment. Just as a follow-up question, I guess, like, whose role do you really see it as to be introducing the public <coughs> to um, things that, oh, is it not on? Great. Okay. So whose role would you see it as is introducing the public to what you would you you would qualify as like good movies because it seems like or not like good movies I'm not trying to be like pejorative or anything but just it seems like there's always going to be an economic incentive like they're really like Netflix is a company it doesn't really seems like there would be an economic incentive to put up movies from like 1939 when like their fan base is like 20 like I don't know it just doesn't seem like that would make sense so it seems like there's a conflict between like like a paradox between introducing people to what is deemed like the canon of movies that you should know, just as there is a paradox in literature is like introducing war and peace and teaching war and peace in schools because it's a 500 page yeah, book. But you can go to the library and check out war and peace and you can't go to the library and check out uh, uh, Good Sam, let's say, just pick up Leo McCarrow picture out of the, out of the blue. Um, that film has ceased to exist. Uh, you can't get it unless it, it's an uh, illegal underground edition, usually horribly duped, probably cut. Um, uh, the paradox is, you know, the more the time passes, the more material there is, and obviously it's impossible to get every single film ever made uh, up in front of an audience. I just am worried that things are going too far in one direction and that uh, a large body of work is suddenly off the table. Um, you go onto Netflix, you know, freakishly they bought a bunch of MGM UA films from the 1950s. So there was a hundred movies, totally obscure, you know, Andre de Toth films made in Finland, you know, where does this stuff come from? It's just some freak of licensing because they stumbled into this block of movies. Uh, when that license expires, those films are gone, probably forever. Um, try to see a, a 20th Century Fox film from the 40s or the 30s, uh, forget it. You know, it's just not there. Except for you know, a few of the very most famous Oscar-winning titles. You can see All About Eve, no problem. But if you want to see some of the Mike Chain films, they're gone. And I certainly don't have any answer for that. Um, there's, um, you know, hopefully the internet is big enough to accommodate more of that stuff. It always amazes me that the studios uh, just let that stuff rot away on the shelf. The Warners has been smart enough to keep it their library more or less in circulation all the time so that people continue to know who Humphrey Bogart is, who Betty Davis is, whereas uh, uh, Paramount and Universal have just dropped the ball. You know, they don't know who uh, Fred McMurray is, they don't know who Claudette Colbert is, and it's certainly not the directors from that, that period. And so it's, uh, again, it's, it's uh, six of one half a dozen of another. It's, it's a constant trade-off. I can only speak from my own perspective in that when I, the kind of research I like to do is uh, into older work, and I'm finding it very, very difficult to run down copies of major studio films from 30s, 40s, 50s. And all I can say is I personally regret that. But if you're into 
TV movies from the 80s and 90s. Uh, you've never had it so good. I mean, that stuff is just uh, out in a tremendous volume. Uh, and I didn't realize there were so many. Uh, so maybe, you know, a scholarship will shift to TV movies of the 80s and 90s. Uh, I don't know. Okay, we have uh, time left for two more questions, one and two. Thank you. I'd like to come back to some points that you made earlier in the conversation. When you're talking about the effect that streaming will have on our understanding of exhibition as we watch more films on our phones and TV sets and computer screens, and also how streaming is changing screen communities into more online communities. I teach a class on the history of television, and in many universities that can be taught in one semester, which I'm sure still says something about TV. And one of the questions I always ask students is, to what extent do you understand the difference between network and people? And generally, people in their 20s don't care. It's the program. That the notions, the concepts that networks have as, as themselves as being different from cable does not register with students. It will when they work in the industry, but it doesn't yet. So my question is, as we are able to watch 80s TV shows, horror films, Leo McCary, The Wizard of Oz, on phones and computer screens and TV sets, to what extent did, will the categories that we're using to understand them start to shift? To what extent will we even think about art cinema, television versus film, et cetera? And maybe will some of those narrative structures and visual structures start to blur together? Because I think the categories that we're using to talk about them speak to the way we've been experiencing those programs up till now. Well, I, 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 I think I think we are seeing the blurring of what a film is into other things. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm very interested in transmedia experiences, which increasingly combine the digital, the print, the the web, uh, and film and film sometimes even live performance together. So that you know, it's not just and that's on the production side. People are blurring these these categories to create new kinds of stories that we wouldn't have told before, but we can now tell in a more integrated media environment. I think we will reclassify things, but reclassification is part of, has always been part of how we responded to cinema. You know, I think about the great reclassification of American cinema that took place after, when the French got our films after the end of World War II, and suddenly there's something called film noir that, you know, even has a French name because it wasn't a category Americans were using to talk about their experience. And we now have re-examined and debated for 40 years the boundaries between what is and isn't film noir as it spread outward to encompass a lot of other kinds of films. We may discover patterns of film production because we're watching things in a more indiscriminate way online or because we're creating new niches. We may make similar discoveries of what production was like at other moments in time precisely because we defamiliarize the, the patterns or categories we use to make sense of the theatrical experience. And I, I look forward to the critical insights that come out of that, even as I dread the loss of certain things about cinema that I, that I really value from my own upbringing and my own yeah. love of movies. I mean, I'm willing to see to a, a younger generation that's more interested in that material, for sure. At the same time, I sense a a real bifurcation between theatrical movies, which are going more toward visual and oral spectacle, and television, which is going toward narrative pleasures, um, where those things were once integrated in a classical cinema. If you want storytelling, you go to uh, a cable or your, your streaming series, um, which are often the same. If you want a, a big visual spectacle, and lights exploding in your face, and, and lots of sensual stimulation, you, you go to the movies, and it's a quantitatively different experience. I, you know, I don't see as many movies as I did when it was my job to see eight or ten movies a week. Often, when I go now, I uh, see a half-empty auditorium people not paying all that much attention, a lot of texting going on, a lot of getting up and walking around. At the same time, the movies become more and more hysterical, you know, pay attention to me, watch me, watch me, and the, the sounds get louder, and the, the cutting gets faster, and, uh, and they seem to be more and more indifferent to what's happening. 
it is like watching a video game playing itself, you know, and what could be duller than that, you know, and, and no wonder they're not very engaged with that experience. Um, and that's my doomsday side. I mean, I, I just hope things don't slide into uh, a rejection of that experience because it's not interactive in a way that feels relevant to that younger audience. That they somehow have a more emotionally fulfilling experience of, of playing a game on their, their phone than they do watching a movie like John Carter or something, uh, which is totally boring and nothing but things exploding in your face. But it wants to be a video game-like object. Uh, but it doesn't involve you in a, even in a pseudo-active way. Uh, Okay, last, very last question. I just uh, wanted to say that I feel my good friend Dave has been a little bit disingenuous to film festivals. Uh, I'll admit to working for one, uh, but Dave used to work for us too, the New York Film Festival, in that you can come and see the artist uh, a week before it opens with a thousand people, but you can also come to see an obscure Portuguese film with maybe seven or eight hundred people, and uh, that uh, even at a festival like Toronto, which uh, shows hundreds of movies, unlike us, where we only show a few dozen, it is a press junket for people in the industry, but for the public of Toronto, it's a chance to see films that they'll never have a chance to see otherwise, and you can go to that festival and see excellent films if you kind of create your own festival out of this mass of cinema that's on display. And uh, you will be seeing the movies with more than seven or eight people in the theater. And I think that as organizations like Toronto, and as the woman mentioned, Seattle, branch out into being year-round presenters of films, that actually if anybody is going to educate the next generation of cinephiles, that the, the festivals have a prime opportunity to do that, uh, because they already have a built-in audience. And I would also just point out that more and more festivals are taking the model of this festival and incorporating into their programs uh, presentations of new restorations of classic films. Obviously, uh, the Telluride Film Festival does that, Can does that, we do that. Uh, I learned here from our colleague James Quant that Toronto is now going to begin doing that. So effectively, people are here in, in uh, Bologna shopping uh, for their festivals. So I just, uh, I, I felt that the film festivals got thrown a little bit under the bus by you there, Dave, and that's what I wanted to point out. Well, I totally disagree with you. Uh, all the major festivals have always had retrospective uh, sections. Uh, in Berlin, for years, that was always the best stuff, was whatever the, the archive was coming up with. Uh, those films are just not uh, paid attention to. There was a time when every film in the New York Film Festival got a thousand word review in the New York Times, and now it's covered in three, uh, maybe thousand word articles over the course of the three weeks of the festival. And those tend to, uh, it's an eccentric choice, it depends on who's writing that week, but it's, it's hardly the same kind of uh, intensive focus on, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, you know Ho Shao Shen emerging from that culture, for example, uh, would, would not get the kind of attention that uh, he did in the 70s and, and then 80s. And um, there's too much, uh, the uh, flashing glamour, uh, and uh, you know, this year the New York Film Festival's big revival was Ben Hur. Like, what an obscure film! Uh, <laughs> we've never had a chance to see this before, and uh, and that was the centerpiece of their revival programming. Uh, it's so what? You know, it's uh... okay. I lied. This is the very last question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I came late into this discussion, so I may have missed a point made earlier, but there was something said not too long ago about the future of, of streaming and video, and I bring a little bit unique perspective. I'm actually a small publisher uh, in the United States, and it seems like the way forward for movies existing on the internet has to be to better monetize the channel, uh, the way that they're distributed. There has to be more money in for the distribution, the distributors and the content owners. And I say that as someone who's struggling with published media and also struggling to establish like much larger companies online. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm constantly amazed that if a corporation neglected their inventory the way the studios do, they would throw those directors 
out. You know, the stockholders would, would rise and revolt and say, you know, you're wasting our resources. But that's just normal practice for the studios at this point. Um, uh, so guys like you, Jeffrey, you know, are going to have to start establishing these independent streaming sites as DVDs, as we are constantly being told, are, are, are dying. Uh, and uh, Criterion has an amazing presence on Hulu, lots of films that they don't even distribute on DVD. Um, this is all great stuff, you know, uh, and I guess that's where I put my hope in the future right now, is that more of that will happen. And, and then maybe Fox and Paramount will come around and say, well, we're leaving, as they like to say, we're leaving money on the table. You know, we should, uh, we should exploit this stuff. We should do something with it. So far, they've chosen not to, but uh, if they see other people doing it, maybe they will too. No, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're all tired. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to continue the, the discussion, but unfortunately, we have a festival schedule. So, uh, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Harry, and thank you all.